This is a production of Cornell University. All right, good afternoon. So my name's Erin McKeon, and it's great to see so many familiar faces. Um, for the last year and a half, I'd have, I've had the pleasure of being a grad student in the horticulture department and working very closely also with Cornell Plantations and their staff. So I really gravitated to public horticulture because of a love of plants. And for me, public horticulture really brings together how plants can be used to serve ecological communities and human communities alike. Um, and so when I was preparing for this presentation, I was kind of asking myself, why, why marketing? Why did you choose this topic? And what makes it exciting about public horticulture? And you guys might be wondering that as well. But for me, basically, um, I felt that this, there was a kind of a gap in knowledge here um, in terms of the collaborative aspects of public, of public marketing. Um, and I felt that by gaining expertise in this um, and coupling that with my passion for plants that I would be able to fill a niche when I go and seek a career after this master's program is over. So today I'm going to share with you um, some of the results from my research while I've been a graduate student. And so just to put it in context, kind of increasingly, um, in an increasingly competitive marketplace, public horticulture institutions have um, started joining together with other arts and culture organizations in their area to create what is called a public or a collaborative marketing group, which I'm going to shorten and say CMG, which I think you guys will all enjoy hearing better than the mouthful of collaborative marketing groups. So synonymously, we'll use those. So in this increasingly competitive marketplace, um, the collaborative marketing groups have enabled gardens and other organizations to reduce their marketing costs and also tap into customer expertise. Um, and furthermore, this collaboration is a strategy for maximizing the potential of marketing and better addressing um, the concept of destination marketing. So this project directly addressed the knowledge gap in the field of public horticulture related to these strategies. Um, collaborative partnerships are socially contrived mechanisms for collective action. A CMG is a venture shared between a group of associated organizations that aims to um, obtain greater recognition, resources, and results for those organizations when compared to those individual organizations working alone. So CMG efforts specifically aim to increase the success of these organizations as they engage in collaborative problem solving, and they also create a platform for information exchange. So the core research question was, are collaborative marketing groups an effective way for par public gardens to market their mission to their audience? And then uh, sequentially, I also asked, what were the motivations and conditions for that garden to join? What were some of the key activities and best management practices being, uh, that were outcomes of the CMG? And then what were the most valued outcomes, both monetary and non-monetary? The methods that I used to kind of obtain this data were um, in two sections. And the first was interviews with five case study gardens um, and key marketing staff at those gardens. And th the second was an electronic survey. And so of the 30 gardens that I sent the survey to, 25 completed it. So as a return rate, it was pretty good. And it was such a small sample size because each of these gardens were participating in a collaborative marketing group. So that was kind of like the key factor in them getting the survey to begin with. So the survey asked about the garden's satisfaction with their CMG performance, and it also designed to was designed to answer the core research questions. The interviews were, the purpose of those were, um, were basically to understand the current practices being employed by these CMGs at public gardens, and um, that interview was conducted in two sections. So the first section was using the business model generation canvas, which I recognize that this, you may not be able to see each of the headers, but this is a visual way of laying out a business model. And I have basically the experience of using this is you bring a big like six by five version of this into a, a, a room where you have shareholder or stakeholders in the conversation. And then we use post-it notes and kind of dialogue to then populate each area. So 
it's a way of visually representing the business model and outlining you know, what, is the, what is the value proposition or the mission of the garden, who are their customers, their audience, and then what are the channels that they reach, reach that audience with, so, so on and so forth. And then when we got to the section of key partners, we turned to the conversation to ask, how does the CMG basically open up new channels or provide key activities or key resources for them to ab achieve their mission, which in nonprofit horticulture is paramount, achieving the mission. So this is just kind of here for um, a visual aid, but if anybody's interested in learning more about the Canvas and the Business Model Generation Handbook, I'd talk to you about that later and could provide more resources. So I'm going to go through each of the five case study interviews now, and basically the second part of the interview, which I, I failed to comment on, was a series of open-ended questions. And so the summary of each interview I'm about to provide is the Canvas and that, that the open-ended questions. So really, it was obviously a qualitative analysis, and um, we had a lot of fun while we were doing it. And it was reciprocal. The gardens gained a lot out of that process of going through the canvas, and then I gained quite a bit of information as well. So my first in interview was with Cornell Plantations right here in Ithaca. And they are part of a collaborative effort of local cultural institutions called the Discovery Trail, which many of you hopefully are aware of. Discovery Trail Partnership is a group of nonprofit organizations based here that promote the awareness and understanding of, connection, of the connections between art, history, literature, science, and the natural world. The goal of the Discovery Trail is to collectively market the member organizations to tourists that are over 90 miles away. And so this is a region which Cornell Plantation, that, that tourist audience is a region that's a little bit less attainable for gardens to specifically Cornell Plantations to put ma valuable marketing resources too. So Discovery Trail really aids in, in, um, in compensating for that in a way. So Discovery Trail is supported by annual membership dues as well as through the Strategic Tourism, the Tompkins County Strategic Tourism Board. And again, I'm, I'll mention its uh, main function is to increase public awareness and positively impact the visitation of each of the member, member organizations to Discovery Trail. So it, one of the things that has evolved out of this successful partnership um, over time is an educational program called Kids, the, Kids Discover the Trail. And so this was kind of a learning moment in you know, even just the first interview where I realized that the, the longevity or the age of a collaborative marketing group influence the level of their activity. So for example, Discovery Trail, once they became more seasoned, decided to create and um, evolve, or basically formalize this educational program through their, through their um, shared kind of collaboration. Um, and I'll come back to that point later in the outcomes. So other non-monetary uh, benefits of the Discovery Trail for plantations include strengthening a, their branded cultural identity of Ithaca, so really creating more of a destination marketing um, brand here in Ithaca for, for people that aren't living here. To, when they come visit, they can really identify with what there is to do when you visit. And then top of mind awareness in potential customer audiences mind. So that goes for both regional people that live here and then people that are visiting, um, creating that top of mind awareness. My second interview is with Garden in the Woods, which is headquartered, which is the headquarters for New England Wildflower Society. And the Massachusetts Garden, Botanic Garden Group was established in 2012 to better leverage um, the various public gardens throughout the state of Massachusetts. And so this was created by the recommendation of the Massachusetts Office of Travel and Tourism. So there was actually an outside you know, body saying, you all, you gardens need to get together and create this. And they also felt that strength in numbers would really enable them to um, increase audience awareness of the 11 participating gardens and make kind of a viable and robust partnership if they, if they join together. So the CMG is still in the early stages of its development but it's already impacted how New England Wildflower Society thinks about marketing. Um, it's funded through member dues, and as well as um, they're able to gain uh, financial support from convention and visitors bureaus and the Massachusetts Office of Travel and Tourism. So that's, that's funding that they wouldn't have access to if they weren't collaborating. It's another, another kind of key outcome. 
So this, this CMG provides a really key marketing channel, and the vehicle for that is a shared website. And that's, a, that's been a common theme. So these CMGs create websites to collectively tell what's going on. So whether that's through an events calendar or just simply through creating links to their websites, this is a way to achieve a more dynamic marketing mix for gardens that a lot of times don't have a very, very substantial marketing budget. So furthermore, the CMG strengthens New England Wildflower Society's relationship with their peer gardens. And it really does reinforce that um, climate for knowledge sharing among professionals. Um, so much in nonprofit horticulture or you know, any nonprofit field, there are various people working in the same positions trying to achieve the same goals. And so if we can share kind of day to day, you know, knowledge about day to day activities, about how to best achieve, you know, the promotion of these individual organizations, that basically is what the CMG is able to formalize the process of. So Chicago Botanic Garden was my third interview, and destination marketing is kind of an ever important um, strategy for nonprofit gardens to use. So increasing, in order to increase their visitation and attendance. Due North is the collaborative that Chicago um, is a part of, and these organizations have joined forces to kind of like bring attention to the do the North Shore region, which is 40 minutes north of downtown Chicago. And so the reason why this is significant is because, you know, people go to Chicago to go to downtown, but they don't necessarily know what's going on in that in that neighborhood up there. And so there is a wealth of cultural organizations there, and they've decided to join together to cross program and cross market. So. The interview with Chicago Botanic Garden revealed that Due North has not just an economic impact on the garden, but also on the region as a whole um, by attracting tourists to that area. So in addition to this destination marketing strategy, um, the collaborative also impacts um, their bottom line by appealing to a few key donors. And this was also kind of a big realization from this interview and the one that I'll talk about next. So people that give large, um, large contributions to gardens then want to have some involvement in, in the decision making and kind of the, the future of how that garden is going to be portrayed to its audience. And so the staff at the Chicago Botanic Garden really felt that they were serving this key, these key donors' wishes by demonstrating that they're using their philanthropic um, contributions in, a, in an effective way by collaborating with these other organizations. And, basically creating a brand to promote the whole area, not just their garden. So the public response also has been very positive to the Due North Collaborative because they like seeing the organizations in their area work collaboratively. So that brings me to Red Butte Garden in Salt Lake City, which is part of a, a CMG called Foothill Cultural District, which is comprised of seven destinations along Salt Lake City's Bulle um, Foothill Boulevard. And the mission of this marketing group is to provide visitors with the opportunity to experience Utah's fascinating art, culture, history, and stunning natural areas um, in an easily accessible way and using public transportation. So the Foothills Cultural District also was really um, created because of the vision of a local philanthropist, Zeke Dumkey, who also gave significant contributions to the garden um, and has like, you know, new, like a building named after him and things like this. So he's like one of their key donors and really important. And he said to them and the other organizations, he said, hey, I give to all of you individually. I really want you all to work together. And so they, you know, they, through, they did some trialing and some piloting of those, that program. And then it, it basically was formalized in 2004. And some of their, um, some of the key key resources that comes out of this collaborative marketing group is they really can leverage the collaboration when they're applying for grants. Um, so they end up acquiring funds because they state that they're in collaboration with these other organizations. And they're also part of a cultural tax district that you know, looks favorably upon their, co their collaborative efforts. So this Culture of collaboration also creates the perception that Red Butte and the other member gardens are community players. Um, and so again, this has kind of evolved in the direction of more shared programming, and it's not just, it's no longer just a marketing platform. So my final interview was um, at the Scott Arboretum in Media, Pennsylvania. And 
If anybody's been to the Philly area, you know that that area is rich in botanical gardens and arboreta. And um, the Scott Arboretum is unique. They're part of um, two separate collaborative marketing groups. And the first one I'm going to comment on is called Greater Philadelphia Gardens. And that is the oldest collaborative that I interviewed. And it's comprised of 30 member gardens in a 30 mile radius of Philadelphia. So that's a high density of gardens. And that regional proximity was kind of the basis for why they created the collaborative back in the 80s. But it also then evolved because um, you know, it, it creates this knowledge sharing among gardens, as, as I've mentioned before. So some of the key activities of Greater Philadelphia Gardens is that they work to promote the member gardens across the board. So some of the members in that CMG are like really well-known gardens, for example, Longwood, which probably many of you he have heard of. But then there's others which are lesser known. Um, and so the benefit that each of these members are afforded is that their reputation is extended by way of being associated with these other bigger gardens. So Another really key activity is that, um, that the pooling of those resources enables Greater Philadelphia Gardens to market to an international audience. And so what I want to give um, just a, a moment to recognize is that, like, that I didn't interview them, but the Bartram's Garden is really small but has huge historic significance. And their visitation levels are like low, and just like every like many nonprofit gardens, you know, has struggled financially. But what they've tracked through Google Analytics and through their attendance is that because of Greater Philadelphia Gardens marketing to an international audience, they get tons of international visitors, and it's they couldn't pay to market the way that. Greater Philadelphia Gardens is, is marketing for them, if that makes sense. So that was just a really key, key um, learning from my interview with them. So the second partnership that I'd like to just talk about briefly with the Scott Arboretum is one that's more web-based. It's called the Delaware County Arts Consortium. And they are focused on a web platform and calendar events calendar called Greater uh, the Philly Fun Guide. And basically, it's it's a way for the Scott Arboretum to market to people regionally. Because even though you're seated in a community and you think have a, you have a good handle on how to best access people in your community, there's always, there's always um, new ways to reach them. And so this website really enables um, Scott, the Scott Arboretum to reach a local audience that they previously didn't know how to. So the conditions for joining um, are, were kind of really a big key focus for this study. And by definition, collaboration requires that a certain amount of autonomy is kind of is, sacri or is, is sacrificed by the garden. So they have to work together in order to and put their, their own objectives kind of on the side. So what's really key before starting to create a collaborative or deciding if you want to join one would be that you, know, you want to understand the institutional factors of the other organizations that you're joining in. You want to understand the culture and the um, organizational goals. And then secondarily, a, a major theme was that nonprofit leaders, whether they be executive directors or key donors, were a huge influential motivation for why a garden would join. Um, existing ne network and regional proximity also greatly influenced the likelihood of a collaborative um, either being created or someone deciding to join. So just to share some of the results of the electronic survey, um, the motivation to collaborate must be based on the CMG's ability to kind of att attain outcomes that the garden couldn't <coughs> achieve on its own. So the survey respondents basically stated that this was a strategic decision for them and that um, joining the collaboration was really like paramount was that they wanted to join together with the other arts and culture organizations to create that strength in numbers concept. And then moving into audience, which we've talked about before, but really accessing a wider tourist audience through shared marketing activities was a, another major priority um, for these gardens. CMGs helped to establish kind of transactional relationships with visitors, but this, the research was not showing that anything beyond a transactional relationship was created. So what I mean by that is 
people found out about the garden or the organizations in the area and they went and visited, but they didn't necessarily buy a membership or become donors. Um, and so that's a way that when you deepen the programmatic involvement by creating something like Kids Discover the Trail, you can start to draw in uh, more of a relational um, relationship with that audience. So some of the key activities were shared visibility, and the vehicle for that was oftentimes a website, and then just creating a, an economy of scale for these gardens to promote their garden through a website and lessen the individual marketing costs. That was a major driving force. And furthermore, the um, interviews backed up that the CMG opened up new channels. So they were actually able to access new customers or audience that wasn't previously kind of available to them through the collaborative. And lastly, um, from the electronic survey, the respondents answered that the most valuable outcomes was increased publicity and visibility of their garden. Um, gardens indicated that the CMG had improved relations with regional cultural in institutions because it facilitated and formalized partnerships and collaborations that were already happening. And so they were now given, you know, they were given permission in a way to, and given, you know, a platform to stand on in order to, pr to collaborate with one another. So across all interviews, the larger the garden and the more established the collaborative marketing group, the more concrete the contributors or my interviewees were on why their garden was involved. And so I guess that kind of goes without saying, but it was still interesting um, to kind of look at collaboratives that were anywhere from starting, founded in 1980s all the way up to 2012. Um, and so each interviewee really highly valued the triple bottom line theory, which really takes into account and adds value to social capital, reputation, awareness building as viable outcomes of the collaborative. Um, so more, more performance evaluation is needed. Uh, you can't just say, yes, we're, you know, we're having, we have these non-monetary outcomes and they're really good. I mean, it's good to have a solid understanding of that, but more benchmarking would definitely benefit um, leaders in terms of decision making and validating their, their involvement in this. And so, in conclusion, um, collaborative marketing groups prove to be a really effective way for organizations to work in concert to achieve larger scale advertising while saving money and resources. Um, they provide a solution to align media and publicity expenditures and help to stretch individual budgets while diversifying the marketing mix of individual, gar individual organizations. Having a better understanding of the benefits of a CMG would enable public garden leaders to comprehend the value of collaboration and justify the resources and staff time that they allocate to it. Furthermore, um, improved forecasting would definitely help, to help them to make informed um, decisions. So ideally, the findings from this study will, and the use of the BMG Canvas and future research will help to um, provide knowledge that is required to successfully engage in these formal collaborations. So I just want to thank the um, professors, my advisors, and committee members, the fellow public garden leadership students, and all of you for listening today. Thank you very much. Question. Um, well, that's where social reputation really comes into play. And as you know, when the when community members or members of these these organizations view that large garden as um, being philanthropic themselves in sharing their brand and sharing their um, reputation, that's kind of where they gain the benefit. And so, yeah, it's really in in the nonprofit field you can kind of create things based on non-monetary, I don't, I don't really know how to answer this question, but basically they gain a, an improved reputation from it. And this can, this, this happens more often in a nonprofit scenario. Does that help to answer? Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.